Welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Friday, March 3rd, we are studying John chapter 11, verses 45 to 57. In today's text, St. John records the reactions to Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Many do believe in Jesus, but the opponents of Jesus are only further hardened in their desire to put Jesus to death. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor David Vandercook. Pastor Vandercook serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in North Little Rock, Arkansas, and Shepherd of Peace Lutheran Church in Maumelle, Arkansas. Pastor Vandercook, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Good to be with you again. As we get started today, Pastor Vandercook, let's talk about some context. We're at the end of John 11. What should we know as we prepare to look at this text? Well, of course, this occurs just after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, and this ends up being the major event that uh, sets off the, the Pharisees to the point where they come to the decision that they want to put Jesus to death. Uh, and so right at the beginning of the text where it says, um, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what he did, believed in him, it's referring to uh, the Jews that were with Mary, that came with her, that saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. So that's that's the immediate context here as far as um, what's going on. Now, earlier in that as well, earlier in chapter 11, we have the disciples, and this comes into play uh, later on when we talk about Jesus traveling away from uh, Bethany, away from Jerusalem, and then back toward Jerusalem again. Um, the disciples tried to dissuade Jesus from going to Bethany in the first place because the Jews were seeking to stone Jesus. And in fact, he had uh, already escaped some attempts on his life. Um, uh, but then Jesus will return again to uh, to Bethany at the beginning of, of chapter 12. So, um, and this, you know, contextually with what's going on in the life of Jesus as a whole, also we're right before we get into his entry into Jerusalem. Um, so, uh, you know, it fits nicely into the season of Lent uh, as a reading for us to consider this time of year. With the this text concerning Lazarus, which we've really just finished, and this is the aftermath, we've noted that this occupies a, a central spot in John's gospel. You could, I mean, centrally, I suppose, in terms of the, the number of chapters, it's, it's mostly right in the middle, but also centrally in terms of the, the movement of John's gospel, there's a bit of a climax here that, that is, as you've pointed out, is going to lead into Holy Week that then leads to a larger climax later, you know, with the death and the resurrection of our Lord. What is it about Lazarus and all that happens with it, with him and uh, that Jesus does here in chapter 11 that, that makes it so central in the ministry of Jesus and, and within the Gospel of John? Well, I think part of it is just simply the fact that this is a miracle that Jesus has performed in raising Lazarus from the dead. Um, it, it's not that Jesus didn't raise anybody else from the dead, uh, but this is... Um, a very public uh, resurrection that has happened um, and that Jesus has has raised this individual. So, you know, it's one thing for Jesus to heal the blind out in public. It's one thing for Jesus to uh, heal the lame, uh, to give the hearing, uh, the ability, or the, I'm sorry, the deaf, the ability to hear, things like that. Uh, but this is, this is completely undoing uh, death. And so, the Pharisees are forced to deal with it whenever they see this resurrection of Lazarus of, is this man uh, from God or not? And even if he is from God, do we care? And how do we handle this? Uh, how are we going to handle the fact that we have this this man who is suddenly very popular because, uh, well, who wouldn't be popular if you could raise the dead? And uh, how are we going to deal with this as as the Pharisees are trying to to wrestle with as they get past this whole thing? So, I mean, 
there, there's a turning point there because they um, they realize that unless they control this, this is going to become a problem for them one way or another. Um, either either a problem when it comes to uh, their status as the popular religious leaders of their day, or it's going to become a problem for the people of Israel if uh, if they if you know they assume that Jesus is going to perhaps stir up a riot or something like that against the Romans, which will result in them having some issues as they have in the past already with rebellions that have been put down. So with the raising of Lazarus, then we're in the the end of this, and we're going to see the reaction to the miracle, the sign that Jesus has done. I think we will probably talk about this over the course of the text, Pastor Vandercook, but perhaps by way of introduction, with the, the thought that this is a particularly spectacular sign that Jesus does. I think in and for many in modern Christian churches, we kind of see something like this, like, why wouldn't you believe in Jesus after he does something like this? How can you possibly deny who he is? And again, this, I think, will come up in the course of our conversation, but maybe why, by way of preview, get us started on that. Why, why is it that something as spectacular as raising somebody from the dead doesn't just make everyone fall on their knees and start worshiping Jesus? Well, I think you have to look at the fact that uh, even after you get after the resurrection of Jesus, there are people who are confronted with the resurrected Christ and cannot deny, deny the fact that he has risen from the dead, and they still don't believe. Uh, and I think it has to do with the fact that it's not going to be simply miracles that's going to bring about faith for people. Uh, rather, the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God uh, is the only way that one comes to faith. Uh, and quite simply, the 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 Pharisees in particular, and we'll see it in this text, um, they don't really care about what the truth is. All they care about is maintaining their level of authority, their level of power. Uh, so whether or not uh, what Jesus did is true or good doesn't matter to them. What matters to them is keeping control of, uh, of the power that they have and the authority that they have among uh, the Jews. Mm. So we're going to see that unbelief come into play throughout this text. Again, we are looking at John 11, verses 45 to 57 this morning. Here is the text. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness, to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know, so that they might arrest him. That is our text today. That's John 11, verses 45 to 57. So, Pastor Vandercook, as we said, we are in the aftermath of the res- the raising of Lazarus, and John begins to record some of the reactions, the negative reaction by the Pharisees and the chief priests and the Sanhedrin. That takes center stage. But before that, we do find a little bit more information. What are some of the, the early reactions to the raising of Lazarus? Well, right away in, in verse 45, it says that many of the Jews believed in him. So they saw what Jesus had done. Uh, And they believed that indeed he was who he said he was, and uh, they believed in him. And then we have this report here that some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. 
Um, we probably assume right when we read that, that the reason that people are going and reporting to the Pharisees is that um, they're, they are opponents of Jesus, and that is possible. But it's really not clear if those people that went to the Pharisees were going to uh, going to the Pharisees in order to report Jesus for, uh, you know, basically trying to get in on their game as being the, uh, uh, you know, the big name in town, or if it was simply that they were like saying to the Pharisees, hey, have you seen what this guy can do? Uh, so it could be a positive reporting or a negative reporting, uh, you know, because you know, why would, again, this kind of gets back to our question from earlier or our, our discussion from earlier, why would someone after seeing somebody raised from the dead have hostile intent? Uh, you know, um, well, when we look at the Pharisees, we can see it because they have authority, but why would the, um, that they're afraid to lose, authority that they're afraid to lose, but why would the individual in, uh, Jew who saw Jesus do this have any hostile attempt, intent? Uh, of course, either way, the result is going to be the same, but it's just interesting to consider the fact that the people that when reported to the Pharisees may not have had any hostility in mind when they did it. Mm. You know, that reminds me of what happens in John chapter 9 after the Jesus heals the man who's born blind. And there's, you know, Jesus, he heals the man, and then he kind of disappears from the scene for most of the chapter while this investigation happens. And it's in 913 where the neighbors of this man and the people who are wondering what happened, they bring the man to the Pharisees, and that kind of kickstarts the Pharisees' investigation. And in doing that, it, you know, it doesn't seem there that the people bringing the man to the Pharisees necessarily have negative intent on Jesus. Rather, it's more they've seen this wonderful thing happen, and who are you going to take that to? other than the respected religious leaders of the day. And that's really who the Pharisees are for the majority of people living in Israel at this time. They would have looked to the Pharisees for what they would have considered accurate religious commentary on things that were happening. And so, you know, to take that man who had been born blind and now can see, to take that man to the Pharisees and see what they have to say makes good sense. Here as well, it makes good sense for people who are wondering, wow, look what happened. Who should we ask more about this? Let's ask the Pharisees. That's who we're going to go to. And, and the Pharisees here, particularly, not taking it, say, to the Sanhedrin or to the, the higher levels, but to the Pharisees who are a lot more on the local level, it make, makes good sense. And again, that's just to, to say that perhaps the report that is made to the Pharisees isn't made with negative tent, intent on the part of the people who are, are making it. Yeah, right. And, uh, you know, just. The, the other thing that kind of uh, resembles that, too, if you think back to that John chapter 9, whenever the man, the Pharisees start to question the man who was healed, yeah. uh, you know, his response to them is, oh, do you do you want to uh, do you want to believe in him, too, or whatever? Do you want to see this man? You know, uh, so, you know, he's he's kind of naive in his response as well, I suppose you could say. But uh, but there is kind of that idea. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and that, that's true. I, I was thinking about that as well. So yeah, perhaps that's what's going on here. They go to the Pharisees. As you said, however, regardless of their intent, what happens is that this begins to escalate the situation. So the Pharisees, they go to the chief priests, and together they gather the council and begin to, to investigate. Just talk a little bit about the players involved here with the Pharisees, the chief priests, the council. Who, who are we talking about here? Well, the Pharisees are, you know, I guess probably uh, maybe a helpful way to think about the Pharisees is that, uh, you know, when we talk about political parties in the United States, um, so the Pharisees are kind of like their own political party within Judaism. You have the Pharisees and you have the Sadducees. So the Pharisees are not um, rulers per se. It's just simply they are uh, respected uh, religious officials or leaders of that day. Um, and so they don't really have any authority in and of themselves to carry out any type of decisions, make any judgments or anything like that. So when they go to the, to the council, they go to the, the Sanhedrin, that's the Jewish ruling council, uh, which is made up of the, the high priests the chief, uh, and the chief priest, who is Caiaphas, who we'll encounter a little bit here. Um, that's who makes up the Sanhedrin. So they are the ones who are kind of hearing the case of the Pharisees who are presenting it to them and saying, look, we need to do something about this Jesus. 
Okay, so the Pharisees take it to the official body that's got some authority to carry out a sentence of, of some kind, and that's where this trial of sorts takes place. I suppose this is a bit unique when I think of you know the narrative that we often hear on, on Holy Week. We think about the trial that happens during Holy Week, particularly on Monday, Thursday by the Sanhedrin there, but John gives us an account here of a, an earlier trial, it sounds like. Yeah, and probably, I think probably our understanding of any legal system is always going to be shaped by the legal system that we have in our own country, you know, that we're most familiar with. And of course, whatever people in our country are arrested and, and then finally put on trial, the idea there is that the individual is innocent until proven guilty. Uh, you know, that's a very commonly repeated, repeated phrase is that a person is innocent until they are proven guilty. Now, of course, with dangerous criminals and so forth, or people that are suspected of committing uh, dangerous crimes, uh, that individual may be held in prison, uh, but they are still presumed innocent until uh, they are proven guilty by the prosecuting attorneys. But what appears to happen here is more of uh, Jesus has already been pronounced guilty by this particular uh, council. And so by the time we get to Holy Week, when we get to Jesus' actual arrest there after he is betrayed by Judas, it is more of a foregone conclusion that he is going to be pronounced guilty uh, and he is going to receive the sentence of death. Uh, so that's just really the completion of this whole thing. So it's kind of the opposite of what we have in our own context and in that it's innocent until proven guilty. With Jesus here, it's more of he's guilty unless he can prove otherwise. And, and it doesn't seem, based on the way the conversation goes in this text, and also during Holy Week, it doesn't seem that they're really looking for evidence that does prove otherwise. If anything, they're going to consider that evidence and find a way to deny it. That's That seems to be what's happening. But yeah, it's, it's a really an important, I think, thing to keep in mind here, the trial that we have here, because it does add to that picture that we have of the trial in Holy Week. And we see that it's just you know, what, what they're doing there is what they've been doing all along as we see here in John 11. So talk about the deliberations that happen by the council from the outset. What are we to do for this man performs many signs? What are they saying there? Well, they see him performing many signs. And, you know, we see elsewhere in the Gospels where there is that question where they kind of talk to Jesus and they say, we know you must be from God because look at the signs that you do. Uh, and they'll ask him, by what authority do you do these signs and things like that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but here. Uh, it is it is more of what are we what are we going to do because they are they're afraid again that something is going to be lost uh, that you know they talk about losing their place and their nation uh, we can understand that in a couple of different ways um, but first of all they're probably concerned about losing the temple uh, because that's the place where they are at, and, and they've got some reason to be afraid of this. They've had uh, insurrections that have come about in the past among their people. There was one in 4 BC when Herod the Great died, uh, and uh, Varus the Syrian uh, legate crucified 2,000 insurrectionists uh, and also burned parts of the temple. So there is that fear that if Jesus were to lead an insurrection, which of course is a completely unfounded fear, uh, Jesus never led a riot or incited riots, but they have that fear that perhaps he could do that. Um, and they're not really afraid of the riots themselves. They're more afraid of the retaliation of the Roman government. Um, and so they're afraid of the temple being taken away from them. And then also they do enjoy kind of this semi-autonomous situation where they are allowed to, to govern matters locally as the Jews, but that's also under the greater authority of the Roman Empire right now. And the Roman Empire may very well cut that off from them if there is some type of riot that is incited uh, by Jesus as they fear. So again, there's really not a concern here, as we've said the whole time, there's really not a concern here at all with whether or not what Jesus is proclaiming is true, what he has done is good or evil, uh, if he does, if he if he's raising the dead by the power of God or by the power of Satan, this this Sanhedrin here doesn't really care. But rather, it's all about self-preservation. 
how can we preserve our place? And the other way to understand our place, of course, here is that they're trying to preserve their position of authority as the ruling council, and they fear that by losing popularity to Jesus, that then no longer will they be the ones that have uh, that hold all the power among the Jews, but now Jesus will. So there's some jealousy at work there as well, of course. You know, with the the idea that perhaps the place is speaking about the temple in particular, it, it, I read that in one of the commentaries that I consulted, and that struck me as as adding to the irony of this text, if that's the way we should understand it, that they are afraid that if Jesus is doing what he, or if they let Jesus do what he's doing currently, that the Romans will be the one to come and destroy the temple and the nation, which you know, that does end up happening in AD 70, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. But the irony that, that struck me was that, you know, thinking back to John chapter 2, where Jesus told them in response to their request for a sign, you destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days, the, the course of action that they're choosing here is precisely what Jesus said they would do, and they're going to be the ones that end up destroying the true temple that is, they're going to to crucify Jesus. There's a, I think it's a tragic irony in this case. Um, and again, the irony we're going to see gets even greater later in a different way. But that that really struck me as I, I thought about this text in relationship to to chapter two. Yeah, that really, yeah, that's a nice thought, and that's that's very true. You know, especially when we talk about uh, Jesus during Holy Week, they're uh, teaching in the temple and talking about how uh, he was going to destroy th- this temple and rebuild it again in three days. Uh, so. Yeah, it's you see the you see a lot. You're right. It's I think a good word for it is irony. A lot of irony in this uh, um, in this text. Yeah, and then the other thing which you you mentioned again is that their initial question, "What are we to do in these deliberations?" One of the answers that they just never seem to consider is, "Well, we could believe in him. <laughs> no, I mean we we could listen to him. We could we could think that you know start to think that maybe when he continues to do all these signs, that he's he, we should listen to him. You know, but that just that never seems to enter their mind here. Which again is the the tragedy of you know stubborn unbelief that no matter how many things are done." It just unbelief doesn't want to believe, and and unbelief can find a reason not to believe, which just doesn't make sense to us as as those whose eyes have been opened by our Lord Jesus Christ. But the the stubbornness of unbelief, I think, stands out very much in this text, and and should serve as a warning for all of us, you know, lest we fall into that sort of a pattern. Yeah, you know, we had in, um, in the in the one year lectionary this past Sunday. Um, or, you know, recently here, we had the um, the parable of the sower, and it's there when Jesus talks about um, the parable. He, you know, he says, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Um, and it's it almost does seem very much that way with the Pharisees here. It's as if as if God is handing them over to their unbelief. Uh, he is saying, you've utterly rejected my word. Uh, and therefore, even though this should be plainly obvious to you of who Jesus is and why he's here, you are never going to understand because you continue to reject and push away the Holy Spirit. Mm. You know, bringing up the parable of the sower in connection makes me think of another application as we consider this text as Christians when it comes to the, the idea of signs and and do they produce faith or not. And we've talked about this at several points in the gospel according to John, but I I think seeing the rejection of the signs that Jesus has done here and the hardening and unbelief is a reminder for us as Christians that it is through the word that is preached and proclaimed by which the Holy Spirit works and, and brings to faith. And there are those moments where a person has hardened their hearts in unbelief to the point that we may not see it, but they just, it's not going to get through to them. And what do we do? Well, it's not, we don't change the word. We don't, you know, we don't think it's somehow on us, but we simply continue to proclaim the word to sow the seed as the sower did and let that do the work. And it, I think seeing it in action here is a, a reminder to us to continue simply to be faithful in preaching rather than trying to change something as if that's going to work. These Pharisees had every single bit of evidence in front of them, and they wouldn't believe. 
the same may be true today. The call for us as Christians is to continue to be faithful in preaching the word. Yeah, indeed. All right, so that takes us through verse 48. We've gotten to the end of the deliberations of the Sanhedrin. They really got nowhere. Caiaphas, who is the high priest that year, is going to stand up and speak and hopefully try to talk some sense into them. At least that's what he thinks. We're going to pick up his speech on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking with Pastor David Vandercook this morning about John chapter 11. We will be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Friday, March 3rd. We are studying John chapter 11, verses 45 to 57 with Pastor David Vandercook. He serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in North Little Rock, Arkansas, and Shepherd of Peace Lutheran Church in Maumelle, Arkansas. Pastor Vandercook, prior to the break, we were talking about this trial that is happening before the Sanhedrin. This is the Jewish council that has the authority to do something about Jesus. And they've been sort of spinning their wheels. They don't really know what to do about Jesus. Believing him is not an option that is ever on the table, it seems. But they know they can't deny the signs that he's doing, and they are afraid of losing their place and their nation. There certainly seems to be some jealousy going on here. They're concerned that Jesus is more popular than they are, that he will take their authority. They don't really know what to do. One of them, however, is about to speak up. So John tells us in verse 49 that one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, has something to say. And this is where, if we were talking about irony earlier, we're going to see the irony grow. What does Caiaphas say to these people? Well, he first of all says, "You know nothing at all," uh, and I think it. I think <laughs> I that's it. kind of just a. Uh, uh, I kind of picture him saying, "You idiots! You, you don't know. Yeah. You know, make up your mind, do something. You know, uh, you guys aren't doing anything, and you need to do something." Um, but he does uh, come up with a a solution, I suppose. Here, um, uh, you know, Caiaphas, the high priest. I, I, the way I kind of picture it is, you know, how on a on a city council, quite often. Uh, if you have an even number of of people on the city council, the the mayor will be cast the deciding vote, you know, if there's a tie. Uh, and it's almost kind of like Caiaphas is playing that role here. You have this debate going back and forth. We don't know what to do. And Caiaphas basically says, this is what we're going to do because he has the um, uh, he has the authority to do that. So. Uh, so, yeah, he basically says um, we should I mean. We should kill Jesus. That's basically what they get. What he gets to is the solution. But the way in which he says that um, is is really really fascinating for us as Christians, of course. Mm. Yeah, I, you know this. You know nothing at all. I, I picture him like you're saying with the city council is a good, I think, environment to have in mind, or just the you know. I'm, this has been, I think, for many of us where you you're kind of sitting listening in a meeting, and you can see the discussion is going nowhere. And you kind of always want to do what Caiaphas does here, like just stand up and say, you guys just need to be quiet, but you're afraid to do it. Well, Caiaphas isn't. And so, you know, you you know nothing at all, and he's got the solution. It is to kill Jesus, but his reasoning for it, that's really what's going to strike us as Christians. So this is what Caiaphas says. This is John 11, verse 50. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should die 
perish. So that is Caiaphas's reasoning for killing Jesus. Uh, take us into this, Pastor Vandercook. Well, you know, the idea here is, of course, is, I mean, just as he says, is that uh, one man should die for the people so that the whole nation might not perish, uh, you know, is, I, this is a common idea. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, you know, one one other place we can look to in scripture that's, you know, a completely different type of context, but nonetheless brings about the same kind of idea is in Second Samuel chapter 20, that you have this rebellion against King David that's led by uh, Sheba. And uh, Sheba ends up on the run from, from Joab, the commander of David's army. And he, he ends up um, basically being surrounded by David's army. And finally, uh, there is this, this woman that uh, recommends to Joab that uh, they should stop fighting. We should figure out a way to stop this, this rebellion. Um, and because what's going to end up happening is Joab is going to take out this whole city and there's going to be a lot of collateral damage if he does so. And so Joab says, basically, um, give me, uh, give me the, the man that I want, Sheba. And so she says that his head will be thrown to you from the wall. And that's what happens. They, they cut off the head of Sheba and they throw it to Joab and it disperses this uh, this rebellion it gets rid of the rebellion that was done against king david so i mean the idea is that uh sometimes in order to um to get rid of a a tension in a situation sometimes all it takes is uh one man uh you know you just need the death of one man rather than killing the many and so you know again from the standpoint of their fear again is they're going to lose their place they're going to lose their nation and so if the only thing they have to do is kill Jesus and they can alleviate all the pressure that might be coming down the, uh, down the pipe for them, then that's what we should do, you know? Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, of course, though, this has double meaning for John and it has double meaning for us. John is going to explain it a little further in his commentary on it. But, hmm. uh, but obviously... You know, again, for the Sanhedrin, it's all about preserving their place and nation. But for us, this is about Jesus dying so that we would not perish. Uh, and this idea is not foreign to John's gospel at all. It's the same type of language we see in John 3.16, uh, you know, most prominently. Uh, and then also in um, John 10.28, 20, where, uh, where Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Uh, and so this idea of, of us not perishing, that word perish, uh, appears uh, again in John's gospel and other places as well. Uh, so for us, this is all about Jesus dying in our place. Um, and in a sense, for Caiaphas, it was also the idea that Jesus was dying in their place, uh, you know, as, as a sacrifice to um, uh, to basically, again, alleviate the political pressures and everything else that they might be feeling from um, uh, from the Romans and so forth. Mm. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, and the other thing I was going to say, too, is that right after this, you get uh, John writes, um, you know, that, that he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. Now, whenever you say that Jesus died for the nation, um, and John is going to expand that in the next verse where he says, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Obviously, the death for the nation means something completely different coming out of Caiaphas's mouth than it does coming from um, John's mouth as he explains this. So uh, the prophecy is... Uh, is is coming from God through the mouth of Caiaphas, who doesn't seem to really be understanding what he's saying, even though he thinks he does. Hmm. Okay, so there there's a number of things that we can talk about. Let's stay on on that track for now. So Caiaphas doesn't seem to understand that he is prophesying, and yet he is. So what is what does Caiaphas think he's saying? But what what does God want to say instead? Well, what Caiaphas is, thinks he's saying is that, you know, getting back to that question that the Sanhedrin is facing, um, that the Romans are going to come and take away our place and nation. 
So Caiaphas thinks he's saying, we can keep our nation, we can keep our place if we kill Jesus. That's what we need to do. So for him, again, this is about the preservation of um, their position, uh, both locally, the position of the, the control that the Sanhedrin has as far as uh, a ruling authority among the Jews, but also the kind of semi-autonomous nature that they have within the Roman Empire. Those are the things that they uh, are seeking to preserve and that Caiaphas says, by executing Jesus, they'll be able to preserve. Okay, so that's that's the way Caiaphas is intending it. But for us as Christians, as we're reading the Gospel of John, and, and keeping in mind that verses 51 and 52 are John's inspired commentary on what Caiaphas has just said, how should we understand what's being truly taught about Jesus here? Yeah, I think verse 52 is really the key. Um, um, not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So you think about when Jesus sends out the apostles, he sends them out to Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth um, to gather into one the people of God. Um, so, you know, you can go all the way back to the promise that God makes to Abraham that through his seed, all nations will be blessed. And we see that fulfillment in Christ. And we see it being expressed here by um, uh, by Caiaphas. You know, I think there's there's a good comparison here to make to um, uh, Balaam from the Old Testament, from uh, from uh, Numbers 23, where Balak summons Balaam to curse the people of Israel, but he's unable to do it. Uh, instead, he ends up blessing the people of Israel. And in a sense, here Caiaphas, uh, although you know, it's not quite the same because Balaam realizes he's blessing the people of Israel, even though, uh, you know, he's trying to curse them. Caiaphas here thinks he's uh, sentencing Jesus to death uh, with malice uh, that is going to deliver his people, but rather actually what he's doing is he's he's pronouncing a death sentence on Jesus. It's going to result in the salvation of the world. Mm, yeah, I mean, the the language in verses 51 and 52 remind me very much of things that Jesus has said already. My mind is going back to John chapter 10, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And he speaks there about sheep that are not of this fold that he must bring, and they will listen to his voice so that there will be one flock, one shepherd. I mean, it, you know, just listening to the way John comments on this, that sounds exactly like what Jesus is going to do here in, in John chapter 11. He's going to be that good shepherd. And then within that good shepherd discourse, you have Jesus saying the way that he's the good shepherd is by laying down his life for the sheep. And then, you know, he also says, I also take it back up again. So, I mean, just, just hearing all this, the, the irony again in what Caiaphas says is so strong. And, and you know, I, don't, I guess I don't know if Caiaphas would have heard all the things that Jesus says in John's gospel. Maybe some of them have come back to his ears. Perhaps some of the people there in the Sanhedrin or some of the Pharisees who are there you know, bringing all these matters to the Sanhedrin's attention have heard Jesus say, and you, like, you just are kind of watching from a distance, say, why, why aren't you putting the pieces together? Can't, can't you see how all this, this fits? And you, you wish they would, but boy, for us as readers of John's gospel, it really is a beautiful picture that he's giving us of the, the totality of what Jesus is doing. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so we've got this irony from Caiaphas. Oh, I know the okay, a couple other things, because you, you brought up the, the Old Testament in several cases. I think uh, Balak there the, and what happens with Balaam, I think is a good one. The, the text from 2 Samuel 20 is one that I, I guess I'd never really thought about. Uh, but the, the way that that one works, it struck me as you were talking about it, that you've got this man named Sheba, who's the guilty one. And what, what he's guilty of is he's guilty of speaking against David. And that's why he gets put to death. And again, he's that death then saves the others in that city. Again, just to, no, to notice the irony here that the son of David, he's the one who's being spoken against, and yet he's the one who gets put to death for the salvation of many. Again, just trying to, to make those connections from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And the, the other thing that I think is maybe just worth pointing out here as we think about John's gospel as a whole is that what Caiaphas, what happens with Caiaphas here, and his words being very ironic that he doesn't realize what he's saying, 
we've seen this throughout John's gospel. The, the one that comes to my mind first, and maybe you can think of some others, but would be the master of the feast in John chapter two, when he tells the, the bridegroom, hey, everybody else, they bring out the choice wine first, and then they bring out the, the poorer wine when everybody's had too much. But you did the opposite. You, you saved the good wine until now that he didn't really know what he was saying here. Caiaphas does the same. This is a, a pattern in John's gospel. And I don't know if this is the climax of it, but it certainly stands as a, a highlight, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, okay. So we've got Caiaphas prophesying, not realizing what he's prophesying. And then verse 53, from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. So that, I mean, the, the verdict's been given, it sounds like, at that point. Yeah, I mean, the, the end result is, is there, yeah, that, that Jesus is going to be uh, put to death. And, and that gets back to what we were talking about earlier, that this, this, um, this, this gathering of the Sanhedrin here that we have that's not in the synoptics um, does, uh, you know, kind of lend us to the idea here that uh, Jesus' pronouncement of guilt has already been made by the time we get to Holy Week. It's a foregone conclusion for the Jewish ruling council that Jesus is going to end up dead one way or another. So in verse 54, we have Jesus' response, and he, he withdraws. Tell us what, what's going on. Why does Jesus do what he does in verse 54? Yeah, it's interesting. There's, there was, uh, there's been Jewish propaganda that's used the fact that Jesus withdrew from Judea to show that he must be guilty, because what do you do if you're guilty of something? You run away. You know, It's the same thing we talk about now, where uh, why does a police chase take place all of a sudden? Why do people resist arrest? Well, because they know they're guilty and they don't want to be caught. Well, that's not always the case, of course, but, you know, it, it tends to be. Um, the reason why that doesn't really hold water, though, is because uh, Jesus has shown before that he's not really afraid to go places that might be considered dangerous. I mean, uh, you go back to uh, earlier in chapter 11 again, and Jesus goes to Bethany, uh, but that happens after Jesus had already been, uh, you know, basically threatened with stoning and death before. Uh, and, and in fact, his disciples try and encourage him and say, why do you want to go back there? They almost stoned you last time you were there. And it's only Thomas who actually says, uh, you know, uh, let's go with him so that we may die with him, you know. Um, and then, of course, the other thing that really uh, shows that Jesus really is not fearful of being in Bethany or Jerusalem, for that matter, is the fact that, you know, right after we get past this uh, uh Right after we get past the uh, this reading for today, we get into chapter 12. Jesus ends up coming to Bethany again, and of course we get into the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So Jesus likely knows that there's a there's I mean Jesus of course knows that there is a um, a bounty put out on his head right now, um, but uh, you know but the fact is he does withdraw for this time, but he certainly isn't afraid because he literally goes to Jerusalem to the right into the um, to the teeth of the beast, if you will, um, you know, right after this anyway. So, I mean, with the verse like this, could we put it in that same category elsewhere in John's gospel where Jesus says, you know, my hour has not yet come, or, or in the events of Holy Week, how we see him directing those events so that he does die at the appointed time and not sooner, that this is actually not Jesus afraid at all, but Jesus simply remaining in control of the events all along. Yeah, I think that's right, uh, and that's that's exactly where my mind was going too. Is that this is a matter of, of it's not really Jesus' time yet, um, and also nobody takes the life away uh, from Jesus. Jesus gives his life for the sake of many. Uh, so yeah, he is in control. He's the one that decides when his time is. So while he does submit to these uh, ruling authorities and he uh, submits to the law. Uh, in this um, act, or in this passive way that he uh, you know allows them to put him to death at the same time he is in complete control the whole time so Jesus now has left the area for the moment but as you said he will come back to Jerusalem in chapter 12 meanwhile we get the context for his entrance into Jerusalem in chapter 12 that's where chapter 11 ends we find out that there is another Passover at hand, and we're going to find out the things surrounding Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. So take us into this last section, verses 55 to 57. Yeah, so uh, the Passover, uh, it begins with now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. 
This is the Passover that we'll see um, Jesus. Uh, this is the Passover during which Holy Week, uh, the, the background of Holy Week and everything else going on. So you have uh, the Passover is at hand, and you have many who go up from the country to Jerusalem to purify themselves. So in order to celebrate the Passover properly, everybody who is there, in order to go to the temple, they must be ceremonially clean uh, uh, in order to properly celebrate the Passover. And so you're going to have people that are going to be showing up to Jerusalem early. Uh, And so it seems like there is this conversation, obviously, going on among the people that are going up to Jerusalem, wondering, is Jesus going to be here or not? Which shows us that word of the uh, warrant, uh, the bounty, if you want to put it that way, that's out on Jesus' head has gotten out. Um, and so everybody knows that Jesus has a death sentence. Um, but they, so, th- so they wonder, is he actually going to come to Jerusalem or not? Um, you know, because if he does, that's going to mean uh, certainly that he'll be captured one way or another. Uh, so, so that seems to be the, uh, the understanding here. In in verse fifty six, they were looking for Jesus. Who who is the they? I mean, we know that yeah. the Sanhedrin is looking for them to, but who is the they there? Yeah, it you know it it doesn't really tell us is the thing. I suppose we don't really know who the they is here. Uh, it could be those who are looking for Jesus, or it could be those who love Jesus and just wanted to see him. You know, uh, so the question of whether or not he would be at the feast uh, would be one of hoping to see him and also wondering if he would risk the trip because he didn't want uh, they didn't want to see the verdict of the sanhedrin carried out or you know from the from the standpoint of those who are actually looking for jesus for the jewish rulers who are trying to put him to death it it could be from the standpoint of i wonder if he'll actually show up if we're going or if we're going to uh you know or if we're going to have to go out looking for him or if he's just going to disappear into irrelevance for us you know so uh it's it is kind of an open question that we don't really have the answer here, but of course it's kind of a moot point because indeed Jesus does show up. So, yeah, that's right. And again, that's what will happen in in chapter twelve. But this is the setting. It is the Passover of the Jews at hand. This is the Passover in which our Lord Jesus will die. In verse fifty-seven, we find out, as you mentioned, that the bounty has been put out. They are letting people know. The chief priests and Pharisees are letting people know that if you know where Jesus is, you need to tell the Sanhedrin because they're ready to arrest him. And given the conversation that we've heard before the Sanhedrin, when they say they're going to arrest him, that means they're going to kill him. That's what their goal ultimately is. That will set the stage for Holy Week, which is where we begin in chapter 12. And we'll pick that up in the next episode. So, Pastor Vandercook, we have about six minutes here to to reflect on this text and think of some connections with the Catechism. I know you love to to make connections to the Catechism and think about what we do with this text as Christians. So, how how might what are some ways that we can connect this text to the Confession of Faith that we have in the Small Catechism? Well, well certainly, yes. Uh, the, I think the most obvious one is going to first of all be the second article of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, you know, and there we confess that Jesus is the one whose holy, precious, innocent uh, blood, uh, his suffering and death, that is what's going to provide redemption for we who are lost and condemned persons. So, you know, obviously we get back to that pronouncement of Caiaphas that one man should die for the many, for the nation. Um, and Jesus is that one man who gives up his life for us. So we get that prophecy of the death of Jesus and its effect there that it's going to result in in our salvation. So the second article is is obviously uh you know looming very large here uh and and we can see it it's going to be fleshed out even further as we go into the chapters that follow. With let me let me jump in with with the second article there because the way Luther writes, you know, the one who's his holy precious blood, that is the price that redeems us. It, the language that Caiaphas uses there when he says it's better for you that one man should die for the people, that idea of being for the people or on behalf of the people, that's sacrificial language. And so again, with Caiaphas maybe not realizing it, we as Christians should understand precisely what is being taught here, that Jesus' holy precious blood, that is what will redeem us. That is the payment. That is sacrificial language. And so it, it does tie very well into that beautiful language that Luther gives us in the explanation to the, the second article. What what else, Pastor Vandercook? Yeah, sure. Uh, 
there's any time you deal with legal proceedings or um, witness being given or legal decisions being made, uh, you have to look at the Eighth Commandment. Uh, and the fact is that is that Jesus' good name is not upheld by the Sanhedrin here. They're putting the absolute worst construction on what Jesus uh, does and who he is. Uh, they believe him to be a fraud, a blasphemer. Uh, and again, this is just um, this is just purely jealousy from them. Uh, so he's painted as an insurrectionist when they're not there. Meanwhile, they're presenting themselves as upright and just when they are not. Uh, and so there's certainly some some false uh, accusations, false witness given against Jesus. And then also uh, they are lying about uh, themselves and their own motives. Okay, so we see the Eighth Commandment being broken in numerous ways here. What other commandments do we see at play? Sure. Uh, you know, obviously, anytime you're dealing with uh, the the innocent being put to death, uh, this is a Fifth Commandment thing. Um, you know, our Lord gives the authority to the government to um, carry out capital punishment, to put those to death who have, com uh, who have um, committed particularly heinous crimes. However, that authority is only given... Uh, if it is used justly. Uh, and in this particular case, you do not have it being used justly. So they're using the sword improperly as governing authorities. They have the authority to use the sword, but they're not using it rightly. And then you also have in your notes that the second commandment, along with the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, is noticeable here as well. Yeah, you know, anytime we're dealing with um, God's name um, and we're dealing with false teaching, uh, the false teaching about Jesus that they have, the false idea about who he is, um, that uh, that profanes the name of God, and it instead seeks to elevate their position over that of Christ uh, and the true word of God. And the interest here, again, is not in finding the truth, as we've said the whole time, but rather it's about maintaining power and authority. So really, that kind of drives us to look at the first commandment, too, you shall have no other gods. Mm. Uh, because really they're putting themselves in the position of God and saying that uh, the words and actions of God himself, Jesus Christ, are not just, uh, and putting themselves in the in the position to judge that. Mm. Yeah, as, as I think about this text, and again in connection with the Catechism, the one that comes to my mind for us as Christians is the sixth petition, in which Luther says, you know, we pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. I mean, I think what we see from the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin here is that they have been deceived and misled into precisely those things, false belief, despair, and now this great shame and vice of seeking to put the Lord of glory to death. How, how necessary it is then for us as Christians to pray the sixth petition, that God would lead us out of temptation and deliver us from evil so that we would not follow down this same path of unbelief. Pastor Vandercook, with about a minute left here, give us some final thoughts. We've talked a lot about warning and, and perhaps some of the, the negative application. Give us, give us some good news from this text from John 11. Yeah, well, I think the good news is wrapped up in, uh, in Caiaphas' statement, quite frankly. Uh, it's better that uh, one man should die for the people than that the whole nation should perish. Thanks be to God that that one man, Jesus Christ, indeed did give up his life for the nation. And that life was not taken away from him. He himself gave it up uh, freely uh, for us that uh, we might not perish, but rather that we would have eternal life. Um, and so uh, Jesus ends up being that fulfillment of um, Caiaphas's uh, unwitting uh, prophecy of his death, uh, that he is the one who grants us eternal life uh, because he perishes on our behalf. Pastor David Vandercook is pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in North Little Rock, Arkansas, and shepherd of Peace Lutheran Church in Maumel, Arkansas. He's been helping us today to study John chapter 11, verses 45 to 57. Pastor Vandercook, thanks for being our guest today. Thanks for having me again. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about the gospel according to St. John, please send us an email. Send that to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week.